Welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar, ADD Title III, Hot Issues and Litigation Trends. All participants are in listen-only mode. You're encouraged to submit questions throughout the program using the Q&A feature located on the right side of your WebEx window. We will do our best to get to everyone's questions. For those interested in CLE credit, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation. Please write this code down. It will not be repeated and is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and presentation materials will be distributed to attendees in the days ahead. At this time, I'd like to turn the program over to Min Vu. Min, you may begin. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> and good afternoon, everyone, to those on the East Coast, and good morning to those of you who are joining us from the West Coast. Um, we're delighted to have you with us today. Uh, and before I get to introductions, I want to thank the ACC Northeast for co-hosting this program with us. Uh, we've had the honor of being associated with uh, the ACC Northeast for many years, uh, and we certainly appreciate their leadership within our community. So uh, my name is Min Vu, and I'm a partner in the DC office of Cypress Shaw. I'm very pleased to have with me today um, our associate, Mike Steinberg, from our Boston office. Um, Mike is a member of the ADA Title III team here at CIFARS, which I lead. Uh, we also have the pleasure of having Miley Gilmore with us today. Uh, Miley is the Director of Labor and Employment at Analog Service Devices. Analog Devices is a multinational semiconductor company specializing in data conversion, signal processing, and power management technology, and is headquartered in Wilmington, Massachusetts. Miley guides and counsels approximately 16,000 employees in more than 30 countries globally. So we have um, a very exciting program for you today. Um, let's, uh, next slide, please. Um, there, the program uh, is about uh, kind of a niche area of the law, uh, Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which applies to uh, public accommodations and their obligations to members of the public, <clears throat> as opposed to uh, employees or prospective employees. So uh, to level set everybody as to what the kind of legal framework is, Miley is going to discuss, um, is going to give you an overview of the uh, requirements of Title III of the ADA. Uh, then I'm going to tell you about kind of the national lawsuit numbers and the hot spots where we're seeing a lot of lawsuits so you can kind of see um, how active this area of the law is. Um, and then we will talk, I will talk about the Biden administration's impact on enforcement. <clears throat> Since we have a new administration, um, there's a lot to talk about there. Then I'll turn it over to Mike, who's gonna to talk to you about COVID-19 issues, uh, because really the pandemic is gonna have some, uh, some of the practices that were adopted during the pandemic are probably going to be staying with us for a while. Uh, so um, we're gonna talk about those issues. Um, Mike will also cover then uh, some of the hot litigation topics that are that we're facing today in our practice, uh, including reservations, website lawsuits. Uh, I will then cover the uh, very, um, I don't want to say broad, but it, it's a you know significant portion of our practice, which is website accessibility litigation. Uh, and then we will hopefully try to save five minutes uh, for questions. But I will say this is a lot to cover, so we're going to do our best to. Get, her, get everything done in our in the hour. Next slide. All right, Miley, um, turning it over to you. Okay, great. Um, so as Min said, thank you. I'm gonna just level set and give everyone just a brief overview about the law we're talking about today in this niche area. So just a little background, this is the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's a federal civil rights law that prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities. This law was signed by President Bush on July 26, 1990, so about 30 years ago, and it covers five key areas. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the employment section, Title I, you, you know, cannot discriminate against an employee with a disability. Um, but the ADA also covers state and local government activities, public transportation, telecommunications, and public accommodation. So that's Title III, and that's the focus of today's webinar. Next slide, please. 
So under Title III of the ADA, public accommodations are required to have facilities that are accessible to individuals with disabilities and maintain them. They're required to make reasonable modifications to policies, practices, whenever necessary to ensure that individuals with disabilities have equal access to the goods, services, and facilities, and must also ensure effective communication with individuals with disabilities by providing certain aids and services to those individuals. So what are the remedies if someone brings a type of lawsuit under Title III of the ADA? If a private party brings an action under Title III, they would get injunctive relief, attorney's fees and costs, and possibly damages and penalties under certain state laws. If it's a DOJ action, there's penalties of $96,384 for a first violation and $192,768 for a subsequent violation. So it's an area that you definitely want to steer clear of. Next slide, please. And just, just so you can all understand um, wherever you're working, what is the definition of a public accommodation? So public accommodation is defined as businesses, including private entities that are open to the public or that provide goods or services to the public. And places of public accommodation include a wide range of you know, entities that you're all familiar with, restaurants, hotels, theaters, pharmacies, doctor's offices, museums, libraries, parks. But a question that, and I'll just relate to this at my company, I didn't think that you know, Title III would ever apply here at Analog Devices. But then I learned shortly after I got here that we have a very small um, website where we sell parts and supplies to the public. So it kind of made me think, you know what? Title III probably does apply here at Analog Devices. So even if you don't fall into one of these you know, companies that's listed here, if you're selling something or providing goods or services to the public, it could certainly apply. And I'll let um, Min explain more about that. So I'm gonna turn it over to Min now, and she's gonna tell you about the national lawsuit numbers and hotspots in this area. brought under Title II of the ADA, which is state, uh, which is lawsuits against state and local governments in order to get the Title III number. So this is quite a laborious process, and frankly, we're the only firm that actually keeps this data. So, um, and here it is. So you can see that um, <laughs> there has been an explosion of growth in the Title III area since 2013. Um, we hit the all-time high in 2019 with 11, over 11,000 cases, and then there was um, a tiny dip, 1% in 2020, where we were slightly shy of 11,000 cases. That is a massive number of cases and actually far outshadows the number of cases filed under Title I of the ADA, which is employment. Um, I don't have that number in front of me right now, but I know that in years past, we looked at that and it's definitely higher. Um, you're probably wondering like why this is going on and um, you know, of course, they're going to be uh, legitimate cases, but we also have a lot of lawsuits brought by uh, so-called serial plaintiffs who basically file many hundreds of lawsuits per year, whether it's driven by the plaintiff or the plaintiff's law firm. Uh, we have a lot of repeat players in this space who are bringing these lawsuits, and a lot of them look very cookie cutter as well. Every year, there is a lawsuit due, I want to say lawsuit du jour, but it's really not just, you know, it's whatever it's hot, whatever a new theory someone has come up with every year. There are new theories that plant the plaintiff's bar comes up with, um, and Mike will talk about some of those. Um, next slide. 
um, you can see um, just for uh, for last year, um, just because you know the pandemic is kind of makes this kind of an unusual year in 2020, we had a, a dip in filings, um, kind of right when everybody started staying home. And I think probably the plaintiffs bar had to figure out what they were going to do about working from home and taking care of their children. Um, so, but then it came roaring back at the end of the year, and we ended on a, a really a hot, a huge number of uh, over almost uh, almost 1,100 um, in December. Next slide. Uh, then we also um, <clears throat> kind of uh, sorted the data by state. You can see California is far and away the leading jurisdiction and has always been. And the reason for that is because California has a state law called the UNRU Act, which provides for $4,000 of statutory damages for every occurrence of discrimination. So it doesn't matter like whether the person was really injured or not, they get $4,000 anyway for encountering a barrier, whether it's physical or operational in your business, making California a very popular venue. This doesn't even account for like the, the very many cases that are filed in state court, which is the preferred venue for a lot of plaintiff's attorneys. Um, so <clears throat> California definitely has a big problem. New York is a distant second. And then Florida, which used to be the, in the number two spot, has actually fallen to the number three spot. Clearly, the lawyers like to live in New York and California. <laughs> anyway, move next slide, please. Um, here, we're just showing the trend lines for California, Florida, and New York. You can see, you know, kind of New York overtaking Florida, in part because New York has more uh, digital accessibility lawsuits. That's what we've found, uh, whereas Florida still has more of the kind of physical barrier lawsuits. Next slide. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this new administration. Um, Title III of the ADA is enforced by the Justice Department and specifically the Civil Rights Division. Um, it's enforced and also the DOJ is responsible for issuing regulations as well. So there's a regulatory aspect as well as an enforcement aspect. Um, the head of the Civil Rights Division has been confirmed. Uh, that's Kristen Clark. Uh, that Ms. Clark is um, you know, from the uh, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, obviously uh, has devoted her career to advancing you know, civil rights issues. Um, so <clears throat> uh, I think what we can expect from this uh, administration is extremely vigorous enforcement of all of the civil rights laws, including Title III of the ADA. Um, I was a part of um, the, um, the Bush administration in the Civil Rights Division, and I think my observation kind of of kind of the you know Democratic versus uh, Republican administrations is that Republican administrations tend to stay um, within already defined boundaries for the statute. In other words, they're not going to go and make new law or push the envelope to expand the law into places where the law has not been in the past. Okay, they try to kind of stay within the guardrails and um, just do what non-controversial cases. Um, in a democratic administration, there will certainly be many attempts to expand the law into new areas. Um, so I think we can expect to see that um, from from you know the Justice Department, and in fact, uh, one um, you know the, the the first I think big action by the the Justice Department with regard to the ADA uh, Title III is a statement of interest, which is a brief that was filed um, by the Civil Rights Division um, in a recent lawsuit, um, and it's, it's illustrative of kind of you know their position on various issues, but kind of their fairly aggressive attitude towards enforcement. Um, so the, in this case, uh, the plaintiff claimed that sued a hotel company for having beds that basically were quote unquote too high. Um, that, they, that people that the plaintiff said alleged he could not transfer onto from a wheelchair because it was the beds are higher than the uh, say, you know, 18 to 20 inches, which is allegedly the typical wheelchair height, okay? so. 
Um, the hotel responded with a motion to dismiss, saying there is no requirement uh, for bed height in hotel rooms, which is absolutely true. Um, there are a million other requirements for accessible rooms in hotel rooms, but, but the Justice Department never issued any regulations saying how high your bed needs to be. Um, the Justice Department decided to uh, basically step in <laughs> and jump into the fray and filed this brief, wherein it basically said, just because there isn't a standard for bed height doesn't mean you don't have to provide, quote, lowered beds for uh, people with disabilities who need it. Um, the frustration with that, however, is that the Justice Department still hasn't told anyone what a lowered bed is. So you can see that, you know, they're doing vigorous enforcement without really providing the guidance that businesses need to actually just, you know, to basically invest in, um, you know, whatever is the accessible, um, you know, item that they need to get, right? So it's a little frustrating, and this is a common theme also when we talk about the website situation, because again, the Justice Department has never issued regulations about what is an accessible website exactly, and yet they're expecting businesses to have accessible websites, which has led to quite a bit of litigation. Um, so moving off of that, um, in the, we can also expect the Justice Department to bring more pattern and practice cases. Um, what's a pattern and practice case? It's basically one where they have found, you know, there's, an, there's a situation that's happened in one location, and they're going to want to expand it to the entire United States, every location that you have, right? So, a person doesn't get their accessible room because of some mix up, maybe even a local screw up, you know, at the hotel. They're going to start investigating whether your practices are good across the entire country and will make it into a pattern of practice case. We can also expect demands for remediation, damages, and monitoring to be much more uh, robust um, and, some, and burdensome. Uh, so that's another thing that we fully expect coming out of this administration. Um, as far as website accessibility cases, um, there were there was hardly any activity, to be quite honest, during the Trump administration uh, regarding enforcement uh, enforcement uh, using it, concerning website accessibility. Um, the, that administration was very quiet on that issue. Um, we it was not quiet at all uh, when the Obama administration was. Um, in control, and we expect that there will be plenty of website accessibility enforcement activity in this administration. Um, so that's kind of the landscape. Um, I guess my advice to all of you is that if you have a complaint that's been filed with the Justice Department, to uh, really work hard to get it resolved quickly, um, because you know, uh, the, especially if you're given the opportunity to try to mediate the matter, um, and you know, kind of sidestep an investigation, I would definitely encourage you to try to get it resolved um, before they start investigating and ask you for all manner of things. Next slide. All right, it's Mike's turn to talk about COVID-19 issues. Thanks a lot, Min. Um, so th this next section of the uh, presentation is gonna cover what we call hot topics that arose, have arisen during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And before we dive in, some of you may be wondering to yourselves, why, why are we talking about this? Didn't, isn't, haven't businesses reopened? Isn't COVID-19 sort of in the rear view mirror? Why, why, why are we still um, talk, discussing hot topics during the COVID-19 pandemic? And the reason um, is that although businesses have reopened and the, at least in the United States, the pandemic has um, begun to recede in a meaningful way, businesses made a lot of changes during the pandemic to adapt to the conditions of the pandemic. Things like that we're going, that I'm going to be talking about and Min will be talking about later in the presentation. Curbside delivery has become much more common. Um, the use of self-service points of sale and kiosks, alterations to merchandise displays and uh, other parts of the interior of an establishment to facilitate social distancing. And a lot of those changes are going to be with us for quite some time and may even be permanent. Um, 
it's also unclear what the trajectory of the pandemic is going to be going forward. So to the extent that uh, the pandemic has um, highlighted certain ADA Title III compliance issues that businesses need to appreciate and um, take seriously, th th these lessons will um, be useful regardless of whether the COVID-19 pandemic fully, um, it, you know, sort of is a thing of the past by the end of the year, whether there's a recurrence or fr frankly, and not to be too gloomy, when the next uh, sort of shock to businesses like another pandemic occurs. So the first section here, the first bullet point here talks about effective communication and face masks. We know that uh, establishments had to comply with uh, face mask mandates during the pandemic. And as a result, employees of uh, public accommodations and customers have been, and, and in many cases continue to be wearing face masks. Now under the ADA, as Miley mentioned at the beginning, um, public accommodations have to ensure effective communication with persons who have hearing vision or speech disabilities. And they have to do that by providing what are called auxiliary aids and services, which are basically tools and, and services that help facilitate that communication. So for individuals who have, uh, who are uh, deaf and uh, communicate with American Sign Language, for example, um, or communicate by use of lip reading, a face mask poses a barrier to effective communication because uh, one component of communication via ASL is the use of facial expressions. And obviously a face mask prevents somebody from uh, being able to lip read. So that has, uh, that has uh, caused some issues for businesses uh, where customers are not able to effectively communicate, customers that uh, speak through American Sign Language, customers that, that lip read. In fact, one of our clients was sued over this very issue. There was a deaf customer um, who claimed that she could not effectively communicate with employees who were wearing face masks because she wasn't able to follow lip reading. And that company very quickly entered into a settlement with the complaining individual um, and the way that they resolved the issue was to provide transparent face masks to their employees. They're face masks with clear panels that allow uh, one to, to see the to, to see the mouth and, and part of the face. So many establishments going forward are continue to have customer facing employees who wear face masks. So that's an issue that all public accommodations need to consider. How do we ensure effective communication? Another hot topic that arose during the pandemic, which we think will continue to stay with us, has to do with the uh, pervasiveness of telehealth, right? Many medical facilities were not allowing um, many kinds of in-person medical appointments. And as a result, uh, providers moved to telehealth as an alternative for providing medical services. So, Healthcare providers, you know, very well may be subject to the requirements of Title III of the ADA, and therefore those telehealth appointments need to be accessible to persons with disabilities. And there are a few different issues that that arise with respect to telehealth. One is um, the platform that is being used to conduct the telehealth appointment. Is it accessible to people who are blind or low vision, people who use screen readers um, in order to access those. For uh, folks who um, are hard of hearing or deaf, um, should, should the provider be considering uh, how to provide access to an ASL interpreter or a video remote interpreter, real-time captioning? These are different tools that would help to make the telehealth um, uh, platform accessible to people with disabilities. Um, also, bear in mind that uh, to the extent that patients are getting access to their electronic health records, that also needs to be accessible. So there are a lot of issues related to the accessibility um, of medical appointments that are conducted by telehealth, medical data that is accessible via mobile apps, 
we have websites, and we know that that the use of mobile applications, web, you know, access to health information online, scheduling of medical appointments online, all of that has become, and even more so during the pandemic, an important part of the way that health services are delivered in this country and the way in which uh, patients receive communications about about their their medical care. So it's important to put into place the systems and resources that are needed um, to provide timely medical services to all people, including people with disabilities. Okay, next slide. All right, so another development that certainly preceded the pandemic and is going to be a part of our lives for the foreseeable future is e-commerce, right? So we're not just going to brick and mortar establishments to shop. We uh, are um, increasingly looking to an online experience. And many establishments have, have now supplemented their in-store experience with an online experience. So that means that the accessibility of a business's website and mobile app is all the more important. And Min, in, later in the presentation, is going to be talking a lot more about that. So I'll sort of leave it there for now. Um, next, a, a very basic service, which uh, a, a lot of us probably came to find very convenient during the pandemic. One doesn't have to go into the store anymore to, to buy an item, but rather can order it ahead of time and can access it through curbside pickup. That was a solution that restaurants and a lot of other businesses put into place during the pandemic uh, due to the restrictions that were in place on um, capacity or on opening during the pandemic. But a lot of customers, frankly, like curbside pickup. And so th th we can expect that establishments may continue to incorporate curbside pickup into their business models. So. That's great, but accessibility issues arise with curbside pick, pickup. One in particular that we note here, you can see the image to the, on the right side of your screen, accessible parking spaces, which are you know usually the, the are by regulation the cl closest to the front of the, the, the access point of the store. Um, some businesses put curbside pickup stations into those spaces or uh, place them in locations where they were impinging on those spaces. That's going to raise an accessibility issue. So when uh, a curbside pickup is put into place, think about what, how that may impact the accessibility and particularly the accessibility of parking for persons with disabilities. Okay, next slide. I want to say one thing about <clears throat> actually a curbside pickup as well. Um, if um, also what I've also personally seen is sometimes first the pickup area is actually put in in a spot that basically blocks the accessible route into the store. Um, you know, sometimes you might have like a non-accessible route with steps and then you might have a longer route with a ramp. And somehow like I saw like one curbside pickup area that was just like smack in the middle of, well, basically at the bottom of the ramp. So that's not cool. Um, another another thing to consider too is that let's say you are a retailer and you decided you are not going to do curbside pickup anymore now that you know the pandemic is over or whatever. Um, and but then you have customers who want curbside pickup and they're claiming that they need it because of a disability, right? They have a mobility issue, they can't get out of the car, they would like someone from the store to bring the, the packages out. Um, I think previously before the pandemic and before everybody started doing this as a matter of course, it was much easier to say that that, that is a, not a reasonable modification of normal policies, practices, and procedures because it's a fundamental alteration as to what the store does. You know, this is not what they do. They're not set up to do that. Um, this is not a service we provide. I think it's harder to make that argument now if everybody's been doing it like for a year, right? So just consider that Again, if you get those requests to really think about whether you can make the accommodation and consider the fact that you might have been doing it for 18 months or however long, 
and and whether we can still make the art, the fundamental alteration argument. All right, that's it for my two cents on that. <laughs> Thank you, Min, for the as always very helpful insight. So another aspect of what another way that that establishments operate, which is uh, the, again was really the acceleration of a trend that you began to see before the pandemic is the proliferation of the self-service mode of operation, self-service kiosks, um, you know, the, the self-service points of sale, and also other kinds of uh, tools which uh, promote the public health, which, are, which proliferated during the pandemic, like your hand sanitizer, excuse me, hand sanitizer stations. These also need to be accessible. We know that uh, in the sort of the height of the pandemic and in those frenzied early months when everybody was scrambling to figure out how to accommodate, you know, how to uh, uh, adapt their their businesses to conform to state and local and, and health requirements and federal guidance. Um, things may have been done in a hasty way, but especially now that, that some of us have more time to really consider going forward, what changes are gonna be permanent? Um, to the extent that self-service kiosks are going to continue to be a part of how you do business, then it's important to think about both the physical accessibility issues and the accessibility of those kiosks for persons with visual and hearing disabilities. And, you know, sort of a, a detailed discussion of all of the ADA Title III requirements that relate to the accessibility of that kind of equipment is sort of beyond the, the scope of this presentation. But one, one sort of example to illustrate the point, many kiosks have smooth touchscreen displays, right? That may have virtual keys um, to enter uh, information or to, to search for an item. And that, that's great for, for those customers who um, are sighted, but for customers that have visual disabilities, uh, the lack of some sort of a tactile assistance may present a barrier to a, a, a customer with low vision um, or a customer who is blind, right? Another physical accessibility question to think about relates to the height of the display, right? Can somebody who is in a scooter or a wheelchair um, see the display screen um, that, 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 that that um, allows for use of the kiosk or other equipment. So those are some, some examples of accessibility issues to keep in mind with respect to either you know, self-service equipment that may have been in place before the pandemic or certainly any new installations of equipment, kiosks and similar, um, similar changes to the, the mode of operation. And then last year, you see that uh, that we, we 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 highlight measures to promote social distancing, by which we mean changes to merchandise displays, the 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 uh, arrangement of aisles throughout the store. If if we're talking about, for example, a store in the case of restaurants, right? We know that capacity limits meant that restaurants had to um, remove tables to space tables. Uh, for farther apart throughout the the premises in order to to comply with social distancing requirements, and that's all extremely important to protect the public health. But notwithstanding those um, public health considerations, the features, the physical features of any public accommodation that mu must continue to be accessible. So to take the example of the restaurant, you see sort of a photograph over on the right hand side of your screen of maybe a table that is uh, part of an, the outdoor seating area of a cafe or a restaurant. The ADA requires that 5% of the seating spaces in a, in a restaurant um, be accessible to persons with disabilities. So if tables are being removed in order to promote social distancing or tables are being moved to a different area like outdoors, right? where let's say a restaurant didn't have outdoor seating before. The, the, the establishment should think about uh, the accessibility issues and making sure that the right percentage, the right number 
of accessible tables continues, continues to be provided. Um, similarly, with a, a retail establishment that makes changes to its uh, uh, merchandise uh, aisles for shopping, there are width requirements under the ADA. To the extent that any changes have been made that could impact the width of an aisle, um, th that's the sort of physical accessibility issue that, ha that has to be taken into account even where social distancing um, is the goal. All right, next slide. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about an area of litigation that really um, sprang up during the pandemic. We know that uh, there there's, are different segments of the population, which for a variety of reasons had very strong objections to requirements that masks be worn in uh, uh, public spaces. And we, we know that most states at, at one point or another and localities had some type of mask mandate in place. But the, the, there was because there's really no federal, there was really no for much of the pandemic, any federal guidance on the ability of businesses to exclude persons with disabilities who refuse to wear masks because of a uh, medical condition or a disability, cases, it really had to be adjudicated on, on individual bases. And they, they did arise, quite a few of them, in which uh, members of the public were excluded from a place of public accommodation because they wouldn't wear a mask. Or in some cases, the person claimed that they couldn't wear a mask because of a disability. So we're gonna walk through some of the, the cases that have arisen, starting with a most recent case to kind of illustrate the complicated and factually intensive issues that arise in these, what we call mask objector cases. You, by the way, before we turn to the next slide, you see on the right side of your screen here, one um, phenomenon that uh, we saw during the pandemic was the proliferation of these fake um, uh, exemption cards or posters that purported to be from the Department of Justice or endorsed by the Department of Justice, which, individuals would brandish to somehow claim that they didn't have to comply with the mask mandate. DOJ said multiple times on their website that, and through press releases that DOJ had nothing to do with these, you know, fraudulent um, uh, documents and, and exemption cards. They never endorse them. They are not a real thing. So, but this is the sort of, just gives you an illustration of the tenor of these mask objectors. Some of them went so far as to create fake documents to um, pretend that they had, uh, you know, sort of blanket exemptions. As we'll see, they're not blanket exemptions under the ADA. It's a very individualized assessment. Okay, next slide. Okay, so very recently, this is like caught off the presses here. Uh, we got a decision um, in, a, in a case brought against uh, Walt Disney Company this was a particular store in a, in a located in a shopping mall. And the, the takeaway from the case is that a well pleaded claim of disability discrimination under Title III of the ADA, claiming that an exception to a mask requirement would have been reasonable to accommodate a, an alleged disability. Those cases, if they're brought correctly, and they allege, you know, sufficient facts um, are going to be difficult to get rid of at the earliest stage. This is this case. Um, in this case, the defendant brought a motion to dismiss, basically asking the court to toss it out without the any discovery, without the defendant having to answer the complaint, but rather um, get rid of the case at the earliest possible stage, and the court. In this case, the Emanuel case, which was brought in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, declined to do that. So the, the sort of factual context very quickly is a parent brought two of her uh, children for one of the, the children's birthdays to a shopping mall. They went one to go shopping at this uh, Disney store location. They waited in line. Um, one of the children, the, the 
minor child on whose behalf the parent brought this ADA Title III claim, among other claims in this complaint, suffered, according to the complaint, from autism spectrum disorder, um, that one of the uh, symptoms of which was that the child was extremely sensitive to touch, extremely sensitive to any sort of contact with the face, and therefore um, requiring the, therefore the child, um, despite the, the parent's best efforts, would not keep a, a face covering on for more than a few seconds. The child would rip the face covering off. And so when the, uh, this parent and, and her two children reached the front of the line, the store employee saw that the child with autism spectrum disorder was not wearing a mask and refused entry pursuant to the store's categorical policy of requiring patrons inside the store to wear masks in order to um, continue to be in the store to enter the store. And the mother explained to the employee that the child had autism spectrum disorder and explained that that disorder prevented the child from keeping a mask on, but entry was refused. This was escalated to a manager. Manager, store manager said the same thing. So ultimately, this mother filed suit. And the court found that under the circumstances presented, the, the, uh, the mother on behalf of the child did state a valid claim under Title III of the ADA. And this is a particular kind of claim. Miley talked about this and Min both talked about this earlier in the presentation. Title III, one of the requirements is that businesses provide, uh, public accommodations provide reasonable modifications um, to their policies, practices, or procedures where necessary to provide access to persons with disabilities to the goods or services that they offer. So the complaint here says, that this single exception for this single child to a policy of mask wearing would be a reasonable modification um, to the mask policy. And that the, the business failure to do that was potentially a violation of the ADA. And the court looking at all, all the facts found that this stated a plausible claim. And it, it highlighted a few different facts which were important. The first is that the store already limited the number of shoppers that were permitted. There were only 10 people in the store at, on the day of the incident. So there, there, there is a low volume of, of customers to begin with. Um, the plaintiff mother on behalf of the child communicated very clearly the sort of specific nature of the condition that prevented the child from wearing a mask. Um, and Pennsylvania's state mask mandate had an exception already built into it for people who can't wear masks due to a medical condition. So taking all of those considerations together, the court said um, that, that there, there was a plausible ADA Title III claim here. And importantly, the defendant raised two defenses in its motion to dismiss. The first was um, what's called the direct threat defense under the ADA, which means that a public accommodation can refuse entry um, to a, a person to the extent that they pose a direct threat to the health and safety of others, subject to certain requirements. But that's the the, the thrust of the defense. The other uh, defense that the company raised was what's called the legitimate safety requirement defense, meaning the store argued that the mask policy is a legitimate safety requirement that it that is necessary to ensure safe operation during a pandemic. The, the, the spread of the coronavirus is something that, you know, is difficult to control. And therefore, the, the, mask, man, the mask mandate was a way to ensure safe operation. What the court said is on a motion to dismiss, those defenses are not going to be addressed. Those are defenses that the defendant will have to establish evidence for and prove um, later on in the case. So here you see that these cases will, these mask objector cases will be very context specific. They will depend on the facts and circumstances as they did here, but if pleaded correctly, they can, they can cause a headache for the, the public accommodation. Um, next slide. 
So in the interest of time, because we really only have 15 minutes left, I think we're going to, you know, let you all peruse the remaining uh, mask objector cases. Um, suffice it to say that until we, until this recent decision that Mike focused on, um, you never really had a particularly good plaintiff who had, you know, who is legitimate. And that's mainly why the other mask objector cases have not really gone that far. Um, so, uh, and, you know, we'll see obviously like how that, uh, you know, the defenses of um, legitimate safety requirement and, um, and direct threat work out in that case um, if it doesn't resolve at some point. Um, so let's move to hot litigation topics. I'm just going to cover these and the website cases to uh, so that we can finish and maybe take a couple of your questions as well. Um, so very briefly, um, because I don't think we have that many hotel uh, participants, I won't spend a ton of time on this. Um, we one of the things that we saw in uh, Basically, like the final quarter of 2020 and continuing to now is um, the filing of uh, many hundreds, in fact, over 500 lawsuits uh, against hotels in California, alleging that the hotels are not sufficiently describing the accessibility features of their hotels on their reservations website. There is a requirement. Um, in the ADA regulations, it says that you have to, as a hotel, identify and describe the accessibility features of the hotel so that people with disabilities can make an informed decision about whether your hotel is right for them, right? So, uh, so the debate is, you know, over how much information actually has to be provided about the common areas as well as the accessible rooms. Um, the good news for the hotel industry, and we certainly represent quite a few of these folks, is that there have been more than 50 federal decisions that, uh, that have been for the hotels, basically saying they sufficiently described the accessibility features on their reservations website. There, have, there are about three decisions federally that have allowed, been allowed to move forward, where motions to dismiss were denied. Um, and then now most of the cases are stayed because um, the plaintiffs have taken three appeals to the Ninth Circuit um, to ask the Ninth Circuit to opine on what exactly has to be disclosed, because frankly, the Justice Department regulations aren't particularly clear, no surprise. Um, so in any event, so that's, so that's raging on. Um, and um, so that's certainly one, uh, one hot area that we've been dealing with this year. Next slide, please. All right, well, now we're going to talk about um, website accessibility litigation as well as um, mobile app and kiosk cases as well. Uh, just briefly, um, I'm going to give you some numbers. Again, this is um, not easy to track, but we actually do track the information. We've done it since 2017. You can see that there's been, again, uh, like a, you know, since 2017, there was a massive jump in the number of website accessibility lawsuits. Uh, we're now up to over 2,500 of them in 2020. Now, um, let me just say this for a minute, because sometimes there's a lot of confusion over that, over the um, website accessibility lawsuits versus um, website reservations lawsuits. Okay, so the ones I was just talking about earlier, those lawsuits are about content, right? The allegation is that the content is insufficient. These lawsuits are about whether people with disabilities can actually use the website at all, all right? Because as I will explain shortly, um, people with disabilities, such as people who are blind, can use websites, um, assuming that the websites are coded in a particular way. So next slide, please. Uh, this just gives you a little, tr some trend line, some numbers for 2020 as to kind of the number of filings by month. You can see a kind of tracking what was going on more generally in the Title III world, that the pandemic did certainly slow things down in April. We only had 62 federal filings, um, and then it kind of, you know, roared back for the end of the year. Next slide. Here we have the top 10 states uh, for website accessibility lawsuits. Um, California, believe it or not, was not the number one here. Uh, New York was, as I, as I mentioned, there are a lot of lawsuits of that nature there. Florida was a distant second, and then California came in third. Now, there's a reason for that. It's not because 
<clears throat> lawyers in California don't like filing these suits. They just don't like filing them in federal court. So they have they have found um, state court to be a more um, favorable venue. And so um, they've all gone to state court basically. And we don't track those numbers, but we know there are a lot of them. Next slide, next slide please. Okay, very briefly, what statutes would might require accessible technology? Uh, that would be not just websites, but also, um, you know, kiosks and mobile apps. Um, if you're state and local government, then you would be subject to Title II of the ADA, and your programs and services need to be accessible, including your websites and kiosks and mobile apps. Title III applies to public accommodations, which we're focusing on. Um, there's also Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. So recipients of federal funding are also um, required to uh, also have the same kinds of non-discrimination requirements. So you might find uh, a Section 504 claim. Why uh, the reason a plaintiff might add a Section 504 claim to a um, lawsuit is because damages are allowed for certain instances, or certainly in certain circumstances. Uh, whereas Title III does not provide for damages. Okay, just conjunctive relief and attorney's fees and costs. Um, Section 508 of the Rehab Act. Now, that one uh, is, uh, I always get questions about this because private businesses often think that this section applies to them, but it actually doesn't. Section 508 applies to um, federal agencies. Um, and the basic Section 508 basically says like federal agencies have to procure accessible technology. So how does that, Kind of, you know, how does that impact private businesses? Well, if you are um, supplying the federal government with, um, you know, technology, they're going to expect you to provide accessible technology that complies with Section 508 requirements, right? There are going to be contract provisions that require that. You might have to provide what's called a, <clears throat> a VPAT form, which kind of certifies that your product is in fact accessible. So um, that's how it affects kind of private businesses, but it really, Section 508 is really directly applicable only to, to government agencies. Um, there are state non-discrimination laws, right? Which, um, you know, every state has one, uh, you know, that applies to public accommodations. And again, the UNRU Act is very popular uh, for uh, these website accessibility lawsuits in California. The Air Carrier Access Act is a law that only applies to the airlines and that, law does require the primary websites of airline carriers to conform to the web content accessibility guidelines to version 2.0 level AA. Why is this worth mentioning? It's just because that is one instance where in fact a federal, there's a federal regulation that uh, has adopted the this standard uh, or this set of guidelines as a legal standard, whereas in the public accommodations world that has not happened. Um, and then we also have um, the uh, Medicare regulations, which also require accessible technology under the uh, ACA, Section 1557. Next slide, please. Okay, what is an accessible website for those of you who have not dealt with this issue? Um, well, I can't tell you that there's a standard you should look at that's legally binding, because there isn't if you're a public accommodation. But as a practical matter, uh, it's one that can be used by various by people with various types of disabilities. Um, if you're blind, for example, a website needs to be compatible with screen reader software that reads the content of the screen uh, to the user aloud. Uh, it can also, it, it's allowed, you know, you can hear it, they can hear it, or they can also have it translated to a refreshable braille um, display that they then obviously read with their fingers. Um, I'm not gonna get into the details of what screen reader compatibility means, but one, I, other than to say uh, keyboard only access, for example, is very important. You have to code the website to actually be keyboard accessible because people who are blind can't mouse, right? So they need to be able to move around and land on important things on your web page using a keyboard. If there's an image, um, there needs to be alternative text because otherwise the screen reader only says, you know, image, and it doesn't tell you what the image is. And if the image is, say, the book now button, then that's a big problem if it, there's no alternative text because, well, the blind person is never gonna be able to book anything. Um, for people who are low vision, color contrast is really important on a website, uh, the ability to resize text. Um, if you're deaf, the big issue really, I mean, that's the, the main issue we see all the time. 
is the lack of closed captioning. This is an easy one, really. I mean, if you have video on your website, you should get it. You should have a closed captioning file uploaded so that it has closed captioning. Uh, don't rely on just YouTube auto captioning because that is oftentimes inaccurate. You can use YouTube captioning though as a starting point, and you can go in and edit and actually make it more accurate, and that would be fine. Um, People who have mobility issues also might need keyboard only access because they might have, you know, the uh, trouble, like, basically using a key, uh, a mouse. Um, and they also would need to be able to slow down basically to certain tasks that are timed. Um, and then no flashing content for people who are epilepsy, who have epilepsy. Um, if you're colorblind, obviously, using color as the sole method of conveying information is not good. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so there is a set of guidelines called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG for short, uh, version 2.0 level AA that was published. Um, it's been around for a few years. Uh, and then more recently, the two, version 2.1 was issued in 2018. Um, it's, neither of these is a legal standard under Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, but having said that, if you ask me, well, what sh what's, the, you know, if I need a standard, what, sh what standard should I use? I would definitely recommend that you work towards uh, WCAG 2.0 or 2.1 level AA. Next, next slide. And this, this set of guidelines actually works for, for both um, website and mobile app. Um, I'm not going to talk about the tortured history of the uh, regulation of the kind of regulatory process for website accessibility, other than to say in 2010, uh, the Obama administration said it was going to issue regulations, basically specifying what is an accessible website. Absolutely nothing happened. They didn't issue proposed rules. And then the Trump administration put the kibosh on the whole thing in 2017. Meanwhile, Litigation is raging because, you know, people with disabilities are, you know, are not waiting for regs. They're, they want, they're suing based on the general non-discrimination mandate in order to get, you know, get the result they want. Um, so let's move to the next few slides. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. And where has that litigation gotten us? Um, I have included in, um, in these slides you know, summaries of all the major kind of, well, many of the major cases, there are a few. But to summarize um, some themes and where we are in the world, um, I kind of made this slide so we could go through it kind of in a thematic way. So first of all, if you're a web-only business, okay, web-only business, you have no, you don't have a place where customers go. Um, those, uh, Federal circuits disagree as to whether web-only businesses are covered public accommodation. If you're in the Ninth Circuit and the Eleventh Circuit and you're, on, you're web-only, clearly you're not covered under Title III of the ADA, right? Um, however, uh, if you are um, in, say, the First Circuit, uh, you know, the First Circuit has said that businesses um, don't have to have a physical location in order to be covered under Title III of the ADA. This was not a website case, it was in the context of insurance. But the point is, taking that precedent, courts within the First Circuit have applied this principle to cover only web-only businesses. So since, of course, most businesses are national and you can be sued anywhere, um, you know, the more judicious approach to this is to consider yourself covered even if you're web-only. Um, the other principle that kind of, you know that I've gleaned kind of from these cases is that if you have a and let's say you settle a case a website accessibility lawsuit you promise to web, make your website accessible uh, but you're and that's you know within the next couple of years or something does that somehow preclude a lawsuit by some other plaintiff who sues you three months later and the answer is no the prior settlement you know does not preclude a subsequent lawsuit okay. So that was um, Haynes versus Hooters, which I believe is in the slide. Um, being in the process of making your website accessible, I get this one all the time, well, we're working on it. So can't we like say that and defend this lawsuit? The answer is no, it's not gonna work. Being in the process is not going to get rid of the lawsuit that you're facing. Um, not to mention the fact that the process is long and difficult. So, you know, you just, it's, it, but it's not gonna work as a defense. 
However, if you're almost done or you are done and you think your website is accessible, obviously that is a legitimate defense. Um, so that is, you know, something we have to consider on a case by case basis. Um, also, another successful um, defense that some, uh, some businesses have been able to use is they've argued that, you know, this particular plaintiff can't ever use my services. For example, credit unions that are limited and, you know, that uh, can only accept um, customers from certain uh, demographic, you know, certain populations, right? If a plaintiff can't ever use the services of the business whose website is inaccessible, then the case may be dismissed for lack of standing. Um, the other thing I want to finally point out because we're at time is because is that only a handful of cases have been litigated uh, to judgment. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, there are very few decisions, but mostly virtually every decision has been pro plaintiff. Just so, so the upshot is you need to know whether your website is accessible or not when you get one of these cases in it. And if it's not, chances are you're gonna to need to settle. That's why there's so few lawsuits that actually get litigated to judgment. Um, and finally, um, you know, I just wanna point out that the, just the uh, Supreme Court was asked to kind of jump in on this, uh, to decide a website accessibility case in the Robles versus Domino's Pizza case. Um, and the Supreme Court declined to hear it, um, probably because really there wasn't a true conflict among the circuits at the time. Um, that might be that might change because we have another case, um, Win versus sorry Gill versus Win Dixie, um, that does set up a conflict. Uh, but right well, right now we're not there yet. There's a petition for rehearing um, with at the 11th Circuit. So um, I I'm sorry we didn't get totally through all the slides, um, but um, I think the rest of the slides are self-explanatory. And let's see, we probably should, um, we can take a few questions then I guess for those of you who, um, you know, who can't stay, um, you know, we can also uh, watch the recording because we are recording this as well. So you can catch up on the rest of it, um, you know, after, after we're done. And uh, Min, this is Dave. You might uh, want to also uh, read the um, the code, the oh, CLE yes, the code. code. Absolutely, the code is ready. Everyone, S is in Sam. S is in Sam. Four six nine nine. Again, I'm going to repeat it. S is in Sam. S is in Sam. Four six nine nine. Miley, do you want to take a couple of questions? You're on mute. The first question that came in that you touched on, but I, I know you have more materials here, is really in the reservation system space. The question mm -hmm. was asking just to provide some trends you're seeing in the um, online travel agency actions. Yeah, so that, um, the, um, the, the decisions are kind of all over the place. Um, Basically, what the what, what the Justice Department said is it's not going to hold the online. So, uh, okay, to the extent there are requirements in the ADA regulations about um, online reservation, you know, reservations generally, uh, the DOJ said we are not going to hold um, third-party reservation services. I'll just OTA for short. OTA is responsible uh, for complying with those rules. Um, the DOJ also said it would not hold hotels responsible for um, whatever shows up on those OTAs, um, provided that the hotels have provided the relevant information to the OTAs. In other words, the hotel has to provide, but if the OTAs decide they're not going to put up the information, then it's not really on the hotel. Um, so that's kind of what the Justice Department has said about it. The lawsuits. Um, there have been some decisions about it. Some have said, you know, the hotels aren't responsible, um, but it's 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 still rather undeveloped, to be quite honest. So we're gonna, you know, we'll we'll see how it goes. There was like one decision, um, basically saying, number one, information on the OTAs is fine, and also, you know, 
the hotel's not responsible for what's on the OTA, but that's like a one-off from a district court. So like I said, it's, it's still early days for those cases. Okay, great. And then the, the last question that came in was, um, have you noticed a rise in persons claiming they have service animal, animals? And of course, they answer the two questions, but quickly it becomes apparent that it's just a family pet, um, especially during longer stays at hotels during the pandemic. You know, service animal problems have been like, have been going on forever. You know, people trying to claim, you know, animals or service animals. Um, it's, uh, it, you know, it's a, it's a case, I guess it's a delicate situation, right? I mean, what I would say is just don't have your low level employees asking those questions. You, put, you always want to escalate that situation to a manager um, and, uh, and really document. If you're going to actually exclude the animal um, because they're not answering the two questions right, um, then, by the way, for folks who don't know, the two questions are, um, is this animal a uh, service animal uh, that you need because of a disability? And then if they say yes, then you're supposed to ask, what work or task has the animal been trained to perform? Um, if they're able to answer those questions, usually that's the end of the conversation. If they don't answer the second question or the first one, then you could exclude them. But again, I would be careful and make sure you have like a manager making that call. Okay. All right, everyone. So thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your attendance and hopefully this was useful to all of you. Have a great day.